Welcome, my name is Cindy Wright and I'm a program manager at the Child Neurology Foundation. Today's talk is part of our ongoing series on emerging issues that children and families with neurologic conditions are experiencing as a result of COVID-19. These sessions bring together caregivers and healthcare experts to have a candid conversation and provide their expert advice to the child neurology community. Today, we're discussing genetic testing during COVID-19 with Dr. Marshall Summer and Mike Greglia. And with that, I would like to thank you both for joining us today. And if you could each introduce yourself, Mike, you can start. Tell us a little about yourself and why you believe it's important to continue the path of genetic testing during COVID-19. Thanks, Cindy. Um, my name is Mike Greglia, and I founded the Syngap Research Fund along with my wife, two years ago um, as a result of genetic testing. So uh, I have a six-year-old boy who has a Syngap mutation. And, um, you know, he, when he was three, he started having seizures and had missed some milestones. And by the time he was four, um, Stanford University, which is where I live, suggested we do genetic testing. So we did the Invite panel and we got a uh, of us, uh, an uncertain variant for Syngap. And I was very fortunate to have uh, what I've come to believe is a really world-class genetic counselor here at Stanford. And she came to me and she said, I think we should do one more RNA test to see if that bus is really pathogenic, if that, if that mutation is really causing problems. And at that point, I'd had numerous tests because like many Syngap kids, we'd first been tested for Fragile X and found negative, and then they did the panel, et cetera. I said, how much is this gonna cost? And she said, a lot, if your insurance doesn't cover it, but you should do it because I'm pretty sure we'll find something. And we did it and I'm so grateful. Um, we'll talk more in this interview, but as a result of that diagnosis, I got connected with other parents. I went from feeling like uh, my kid was uniquely weird to having a community and being able to, to find a pathway and a sense of, of when we're gonna be able to have therapy. So, we started funding research and created the Syngap Research Fund to do that. It's been two wonderful years and, and I've really come to understand and appreciate how important and difficult genetic counseling and genetics is through my time in this space. And I'm really excited to be here. So my name is Marshall Summer. I've been doing this for, gosh, a number of years in the field of genetics. I started back in the mid 80s. I had the interest of watching it go from being able to test chromosomes to I got to be part of the Human Genome Project in the 90s to watching all the new developments around next generation sequencing. And I can say there are very few fields where something has been as transformative as this has. Um, I currently run the Rare Disease Institute at Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. I've been uh, started life as a pediatrician and then went into medical genetics as a postdoctoral fellowship in the 80s and then have stayed in the field ever since then. And I've gone, it's really gone from a field where we could diagnose maybe one to two dozen diseases with any real certainty to now we can probably diagnose maybe over 8,000 conditions. I actually did the math the other day on this. We're actually discovering up to six to 10 new disease associations to gene changes a week. So if you like informatics and if you like trying to find out how these tools match up, uh, it is probably one of the best fields uh, for absolutely doing that. But on a more personal note, to me, the patients and the families um, I get to work with and the ones I've gotten to know over the years, one of the reasons genetic testing has been so important is we can find reasons and answers. Once upon a time, I used to have to tell a lot of my families, well, we think this is probably genetic, but we really don't know which gene. We don't really have that much knowledge or information right now. And we kind of had to leave it there. It was not satisfying for anyone. And it makes it really hard to select your best therapies or develop new therapies if you don't know what's going on. So for me, this advent of expanded genetic testing using whole exome, using whole genome, some of the new toys and tools around RNA. It's just fascinating what can be done now in the answers. Whereas once maybe it was 20 to 30% of patients we could diagnose, now it's north of 70 to 80% and climbing. So for me, it's just been a complete renaissance for my field. 
Great. So, Marshall, that we have a few questions to go through in this interview. Sure. Um, the first one is, can you explain from, from your perspective where you sit, why you think genetic testing is important and could be considered a, a treatment tool during, during these strange COVID-19 times? Well, I would say it's a treatment tool whether we're in COVID times or not, but particularly now that um, we're doing so much care remotely. Uh, the genetic testing is really, it will never replace, I think, the face-to-face -face physical examination and the data that we get there because that allows us to connect the patient's phenotype to the molecular genotype. But we're at a point right now where we can't examine patients. We can't sit there with a family and that, but we can do a lot of things by digital and remote. But one of the things we can do is mail specimen collection kits to families where they can get a cheek swab, get a DNA sample, and we can do the most sophisticated testing in the world without them having to leave their home. And we've been using that a lot lately. Yeah, that's great. Um, and once they get those results, it, it's not binary, right? It's not always crystal clear what those oh, no. results say. Um, yeah. I mean, in my, in my capacity running a rare disease group, we, you know, we're, we're connected with parents all across the country and people will, parents just left, just last night, a parent got a note from the testing company saying, hey, we think we found another bus. And this poor mom went to Dr. Google and just said, was pulling her hair out, messaging people saying, what's going on? And I was like, you need right. a genetic counselor because it's, you know, these things are complicated and I could go to Dr. Google too and engage you, but I really, I talked to a genetic counselor. But from, again, from your expert position, could you talk about the field of genetic counseling, how it's evolving and, and how sh people should think about reaching out to them? Sure, and there's actually, a, there's actually kind of two questions embedded there. First off, mm -hmm. if I do expanded genetic testing on pretty much any patient I ever see, we'll find variations. Every single human being has thousands to millions of variants between themselves and another human being, some of which are novel, some of which mean something from a disease standpoint, some of which don't mean anything. So we're at the stage right now in understanding the human genome where there's a few things, you know, it's what you know, what you don't know, what you don't know, you don't know. And what we know, we know is a small bit. What we don't know, we don't know is a bigger bit. What we don't know, we don't know is an even larger bit. And it's gonna take a long time to sort of fill in the markers, but that's one of the big projects that's going on right now is how do we determine which variations or combinations can actually result in a human disease. And this is where genetic counseling is absolutely crucial. I'm uh, very fortunate. I work with a great team of about 14 genetic counselors and as part of our program here. And they are absolutely key to our family. They're the link between this vast um, new testing ocean in which there are so many things that you can find, so many variations that will come back and actually trying to make that relevant to a family. One of the biggest jobs they have is actually managing expectations. Now, if you watch a TV show in a half hour, we're gonna sequence your DNA, prove that you did something 30 years ago and um, you know, wrap it up very neatly without any loose ends. And it just doesn't work that way. Um, with any patient, we'll find numerous variants, some of which you can make a story for causing a disease but if it's one we haven't seen before, I think you, you said it earlier, we call them VUSs or VUs, or they go by a number of acronyms, which stands for Variation of Unknown Significance. And one of the most common things we have to do now is work through how those variants of unknown significance may be relevant to a patient and family. And that's where the genetic counselors really shine. They can work with the family, find history, find other folks that may be tested, that maybe we can get a clue that that change may be related to that, um, but also working with the family to get that level of uncertainty. As you said, it's not binary anymore. Uh, almost everything we deal with now in genetics is probabilistic. So this change may have caused this. Um, we used to sort of laughingly refer to it as the interpretive dance part of genetic testing, where you have to take the variants that you found and match them with the phenotype you see. Now, these are real diseases with real families and real people. I don't want to make light of that. But there is a certain amount of 
how do you make the story for these two things to fit? Genetic counselors are great at finding those things, but also finding ways to test and prove them as your own experience, I think would dictate. Yes, I was actually talking to another one of our board members this morning, and she shared with me that did a panel, had a bus for Syngap, and the genetic counselor uh, that she was dealing with said, I don't, think this is, I don't think this is the problem. Another year went by battling with insurance, getting things funded, did whole exome, and they came back and they said, no, it's, it's, definitely, a Syngap, it's definitely a pathogenic Syngap mutation. And we were like, well, what, what was the difference? Why? And the answer was, in the, fir the first physician didn't submit a rich clinical history, and the second one did. And, and I'm sure there were other factors as well. I mean, a, a year later, her, her symptoms were much more pronounced, but it really brought home for me to sort of two things. One, how important that role of a genetic counselor is to be nose to nose with the families, to be able to be in discussion and, and probing. Certainly mine forced me to do the test that helped me figure out what was wrong with Tony, but also that it's, it's, it's not black and white. And, you know, it's not, I think when parents get the answer, they're like, this is the answer. And the, Yes, there's a tremendous amount of science behind it, and we have, you know, you've forgotten more genetics than I'll ever know, but it, it's also a great conversation. It's also important for there to be a conversation, I think, between a genetic counselor who's a translator between this vast amount of science and the parent who knows the patient best so that they can yeah. say, this is crystal clear, or this maybe we need to probe more, you know. Um, I would absolutely agree with you. I think, you know, that's one of the reasons it's so important. You have your clinical geneticists, they're trying to get that physical phenotype there. You have the counselor working with the information with the family, pulling out, you know, what can we pull out of that family history that's going to be helpful there. But at the end of the day, still often the most common answer is maybe. And, you know, the question is, at what point does maybe become an operational answer? And I would say in genetics, almost more than any other field, maybe is an operational answer because with a lot of these things, we can't show that that specific change really did that. And it changes every year. So what was a variant one year, a variant that no one thought did anything, suddenly we may see that same variant in four or five patients with the same clinical disease because we've got good clinical examinations, good clinical history, good family history. Suddenly then that changes it. And then it's like, okay, this looks like the smoking gun here. So there can't be really almost too little data collected to try to tie these things together. I think um, I actually had a colleague once in the late 90s uh, say that he thought that uh, genetic testing would make the physical examination obsolete. Mm -hmm. um, I saw him recently at a meeting and I said, so you, you still feel that way? And he said, uh, no, not so much. You still have to have great clinical characterization, great histories, and that's where the counselors working with the clinical genetics team and back and forth really come to shine. Yeah, and I, I think also it's important for parents to understand, you know, Syngap, which is again the only thing I know anything about, 10 years ago there were 10 patients. So we had a very crisp description of what Syngap looked like in these 10 patients who were pretty severe to be the first one sequence. Right. Today we have five, I've counted 530-ish we have a much broader spectrum of what Syngap looks like. So there's more, there's, there, there's more reason to be like, oh yeah, this is, this is Syngap. But I, we have this list of questions. So um, okay, I, wanna ask, I wanna ask you this next one. Um, now that genetic testing is getting cheaper and we're, we, you know, in the, again, 10 years ago, either a researcher was funding it or parents were shelling out a tremendous amount of money. Now you can do the panel private pay for a few, I think a few hundred dollars if I'm not mistaken. Does that change when you're looking at an undiagnosed person? Does that change sort of the when you pull that arrow out of the quiver? I mean, I, I get the sense that 10 years ago, genetic testing was, okay, we've tried everything else. Maybe we'll try sequencing. Whereas now, maybe you do that before you do other things. Or, or is it Absolutely. Um, the, the paradigm's changed. So one thing I think we're going to be able to do is actually significantly reduce the time to diagnosis. I'm actually part of a global commission on looking at that. And you know, what it boils down to many times is go broader on sequencing earlier. Now, you still have the problem that you may find a lot of variants and you better have a good clinical history. Um, but we're using it more and more in an early phase of testing. The, the cost has come down enough. 
I mean, as little as you know, seven, eight years ago, exomes were more than $20,000 or more. Now, exomes are down to around you know, one to 2,000, but genomes are gonna replace those very quickly. And with the new next generation uh, genome testing, you think about it, you're getting 6 billion bits of data almost with that. So, you know, actually computer processing speed suddenly becomes a real big factor in looking at these, but you know, there's a lot of progress there. But we also can condense testing down. We can do a, the equivalent of a chromosome study, looking to see if all the chromosomes are there, looking to see if little pieces are missing or duplicated all in that one test. So we're able to consolidate down to one test. So the question actually to ask is eventually, does everyone get a whole genome that data sits in the background as part of your permanent medical record. And then if something does happen, then you can query it specific to what's going on then. I, I can actually see that happen. It, from a privacy standpoint, scares me a little bit, but um, from the standpoint of being able to use that, if the cost is below you know, one to $2,000 for getting that uh, test run and that data stored, then I think you'll see it used pretty widely. So yes, it is, drastically changed. It has reduced the time to diagnosis because we used to have, we used to have to very parsimoniously or miserly use genetic testing because it was so expensive. As the cost has come down and the payers recognize that value along with the, you know, the reduced cost, we can use it much more liberally and it's made a huge impact. Um, and then when, when parents do this, this is sort of coming back to our first question, like for the uninitiated, what kind of samples are they submitting? Is it, can you do sure. a whole exome or a whole genome? And maybe it would be helpful just if we explain the difference between those. Yeah, let me, let me kind of give you a, a quick primer on what we're talking about here. Yeah. So um, think of different types of genetic testing as satellite imagery of the earth. So very early days, we'd take a picture of the earth and the best we could tell is all the continents were there. Um, you know, Spain was still attached to Europe. That's, that's what we would have called a chromosome study. Next came the microarray studies. Microarray studies are where we would take small fragments of DNA, bind them to everything and see if pieces were missing or duplicated. So suddenly we could look and say cities are there. That city's there, that city's there, um, that mountain range is there. So large geographic features, we could do that. Then we get into the sequencing level. And with whole exome, remember, that's only about four to five percent of the human genome, but it's the part of the human genome that actually is encoded into proteins. So you're leaving out all the control regions and everything else, but that's sort of like saying, okay, I can go into some one drawer in your house and I can look at all the socks. And I can see if you've got, you know, two of each sock and they're the right color and everything like that. And I can look actually at the DNA sequence for the all the genes that are encoded into protein. Whole genome is basically, I'm opening up every drawer in your house and every drawer in your neighbor's houses and down the street and I'm dumping everything out and taking a look at it. And I can tell if not only if your socks are there, I can tell if your street's there and I can tell if your city's in one piece. So it's a much finer resolution with a massive amount of data. They're both based on similar techniques of sequencing individual bases of DNA it's just how much of the genome you're sequencing in those, which uh, is what makes the difference there, because that affects computational uh, things like that. So just think of it as a refining of how much you can tell from the image you're getting from that. So if I look at the comparison between exome and genome, um, it, almost every time we add technologies like this, we'll shave some percentage off the patients we can't diagnose. So when we went from, you know, karyotype to microarray, we shaved probably 20, 30% off of that. The microarray rates were about 20% abnormal. When we went to exome, we took it up to about 50 to 60%. We can see with genome, we can probably get north of 80% on diagnosis. So you're just basically pulling a few more folks into that envelope where you can come up with a diagnosis for them. And do you need different samples if you get into those higher resolution? I mean, can this all be done with saliva or? You know, um, if you'd asked me that two years ago, my answer would have been you need blood to do the genome and it's better for that for the exome. If you talk to the laboratories, they still like to get DNA from blood, but actually what we're finding is the DNA that comes out of the cells from a cheek swab 
um, not so much the saliva, but it's actually the cells in that saliva, actually can give you enough DNA to do both of those tests and get um, pretty decent resolution. One thing to remember about saliva, it's got a lot of bacterial DNA in it too, because your mouth's full of bacteria, but they can actually screen out for that pretty easily. So, so yeah. So in yeah, you can do it. Time, That's how we're actually doing it now, particularly in the time of COVID, is we're sending uh, spit kits to people. Um, much easier than sending them the draw your own blood at home kit. Um, mm -hmm. And it actually works very nicely. Yeah. I remember when our second son was born, my wife was insistent, although the odds of having two kids with a mutation are remarkably low. She was like, we got to test this kid. And as soon as we get saliva out of that little baby's mouth, I was, I was using one of those spit <laughs> You're in there with a Brillo pad, just trying to scrape cheek cells. Yeah, there you go. I don't know how much I want to admit on video, but um, <laughs> we, we talked about the cost of testing and and right. the chance with insurance. Is there anything any any comfort you can give to families there? And 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 I just want to interject here too, in your beautiful analogy, where you went from uh, chromosome to microwave to exome genome, you didn't mention panels. And I wonder if they're relevant for the insurance discussion. I, I just sure. think about them because that's what that's what that's where we were. So, well, let me first off let me define for the viewers what we mean by a panel here. That's where you're doing sequencing, but you're doing it on a select number of genes. And we actually have two kinds of panels that we do right now. One, where a chip has been developed specifically for that set of genes. The problem with that is about every other day we're finding new genes that cause these diseases, so those become irrelevant very quickly. Yeah. The other type of panel is what we call a digital panel. Uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier is the vast amounts of computational power to go through and analyze all the genes and all the sequence. What we'll do now is actually do a digital um, focus down on a set of genes. So um, let's say, let's take epilepsy. So we'll have a certain number of epilepsy genes We'll run the chip that does either a whole exome or a whole genome, but the data we'll analyze is just going to be the genes relevant to the clinical condition. That saves a lot of time on interpretation. It saves a lot of time on uh, generating the pathology reports, things like that. But let's say next week, a new gene pops up for that disease. You can go back and query that from the data that's already in the background. So panels um, can be, one can be a virtual panel that can expand and grow with time. And then you can always look at the data behind it. The other are the physical fixed panels, which I think are starting to fade out as far as their popularity. Because like I said, once you've built one, they're fast, they're cheap, but they're limited. You know, they're, but there are some areas where they're still quite useful. Some in drug metabolism, seizures, some, and some other things like that, they're still quite useful. But I would say we're gonna see those fade out. And then you brought up the real uh, elephant in the room, which is insurance coverage. This is something we spend more time on than we do anything else. And part of it is the payer's understanding of the impact on their patients, but also on the cost of their patients is kind of lagged behind the progress in technology and understanding of disease. And you know, we just finished an analysis right now where we're finding that actually once you've diagnosed a patient with a rare disease, the actual cost goes down because you're not on that diagnostic odyssey anymore. And the payers are still kind of reflexively reacting to when DNA sequencing costs a whole lot more than it does now. So we spent a lot of time getting authorization for testing. We're usually successful, but the amount of work is quite high. So I think some payers are starting to catch up there. Some are starting to realize that authorizing that sooner may actually save them a lot of money in diagnosing that patient and in treating them if you can treat them earlier. When a doctor says to a family who suspects this might be a genetic cause or when an insurance company more likely says, um, you know, pro probably not, don't worry about getting a genetic test or you don't need to talk to a genetic counselor. How can they advocate for that with whatever the audience is? Um, because unfortunately, there are some physicians who are, uh, for lack of a better term, very old school and say, you could do it, it's expensive, you probably won't learn much, and if you did, you wouldn't learn anything. That might have been true once. I, I strongly argue it's not true today. What can families who are on this diagnostic odyssey say to insurance and to physicians? 
Well, fortunately, at least in the US, the needle's moved. In Europe, the needle has moved. In areas where resources are thin, to say the least, um, that's going to continue to be a problem um, for a while. Some of it is the training, some of it's the attitude. Um, I mean, just as an example, um, phenylketonuria, a disease we've known about for over 60 years uh, and can treat with simple dietary changes. Um, one very large um, country in Asia actually refused to do the testing or because they didn't want to pay for the formula as a public um, health benefit, even though you can end up intellectually normal with that treatment. So some of them are societies make choices about what they're going to pay for and what they're not going to pay for. Uh, some of it is, like I said, catch up. It's like, um, if you'd ask me a couple of years, I'd say the insurance payers in the US are way behind. Now I'll just say they're behind uh, as far as getting their heads around that. Uh, but I've had a lot of patients in the past. I've had patients with Down syndrome who um, physicians would say, why bother testing or don't bother trying to teach them to do anything because you know it's just a waste of your time. And I would say everyone's moved on from that. Some people just haven't quite gotten the note yet. Um, and for a disease that doesn't have a therapy or is got a really severe phenotype, you know, they used to say that about leukemia in children. And that, you know, that was just, uh, why would we even bother to diagnose and treat it? Because it's a death sentence. Now it's the most treatable childhood cancer because someone actually said, no, that's not good enough. And I would say a lot of my career has been around the that's not good enough approach. Uh, you need to figure out what these things are. You need to figure out what you can do about them. And for some families, the best you're going to do is say, here's what it is. So at least you know what did this. And for some families, here's something that's going to help a little bit. And for some families, it's we're going to try to help the next family. We can't, I can't fix it today. But you know what? If we learn about it, if we can deep dive on it, if we know what the defect in the blueprint is that tells us where to go looking, that's how we make change. That's how we make a difference. Yeah. So if they come up against someone, a doctor saying no, what's the best bet? Just seek out a second opinion, find another yeah. physician? Well, that's one nice thing about all of the advent of the use of telemedicine these days. You can seek out a second. I would, I would strongly recommend um, looking at a group like NORD, National Organization for Rare Disorders. They have really good resource lists. I think you guys are on there, actually, if I'm not mistaken. You know, I, so thank you. That's great. And, and, I, and I wanted to interrupt you, but, you know, it's bad form on these videos. No, that's okay. That's a good place. Um, I wanted to thank you for all those times you have said that's not good enough on behalf of families like mine, um, because it's, it's really hard. And I do, all, I do this all the time, so I find myself on families different levels of resources, emotional, financial um, support. And it's, it's, it's really hard when you're dealing with families who can't get an answer. So doctors well, like you make a difference. I'm um, going to flip it back to you because to be honest, the best privilege and the best part of my job is I get to work with these families with um, some, of the, some of the toughest situations you've ever seen. They let us into their lives in a way that very few physicians are ever allowed into anyone's lives. I mean, we... We find out about everybody in the family. Um, on a lighter note, if you ever want to find out about all the bad stuff on the other side, ask the grandparents from one side about the other side of the family. And you'll get it. <laughs> That's a pro trip. I, I want to ask you just one question before I give it back to Cindy. And I, um, okay. when I meet a family with a kid with a kid who's having seizures, like my kid had seizures, right. or increasingly a kid who's got a pretty severe autism phenotype. It's a, it's a weird conversation to have on a playground, but I say, hey, have you considered a, panel, a, a genetic panel for that? Like, hey, maybe something's wrong with your kid's genes. Like that almost never goes over well, but they say, well, why would I do that? And my answer is, you know, there are pe we're developing medicines that are, can actually go to exactly what's wrong and sometimes address it. And then there's also all the existing medicines where once you know what gene is, is not performing, we know some, some, some of the existing meds are good for that and some are actually deleterious or bad. So it's really useful knowledge. That's my amateur answer to other parents. How would you, would you agree with that? Or would that's you a, that's actually a great answer. Okay. Well, if you think about it, before we had this level of molecular testing, 
we had to use what I would call sort of the roulette wheel of testing. You know, you have X number of drugs, you spin it, the ball falls in one, maybe that one worked, maybe it didn't. You know, and you went with the ones that worked on a wider group first, but that didn't work, you had to try it for a while and then you go to another one. In the meantime, you may have a patient that's having a lot of problems, a lot of seizures or whatever other genetic issue they have. With the testing, a lot of times we can eliminate a lot of the things we shouldn't try Mm -hmm. and then actually start to come down on the things we could. And, and that's an evolving thing. I mean, we're finding more and more every day when we start looking, okay, everybody that's got a change in this gene or can process this drug this way uh, because of their genetics, let's find a much better therapy. Um, as usual, cancer and chemotherapy is ahead of us on this. They've been doing this for a while. They've been targeting molecular therapies. I think with great precision on that. I think epilepsy is probably the next area where this is going to have a huge impact and it's already starting to. Yeah. Part of it comes down to getting the data, is finding out who's got what changes, who responded to what drug. So while it might not necessarily have a huge impact right this second, it's going to. And for some patients, it already does. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point to end on because we, we, We've just figured out as a rare disease group, it's, it's, it's important to pay for postdocs, but what we really need to constantly up our game on is organizing our data so that when that therapy comes, we are ready and we don't, the yeah. drug company doesn't have to waste time doing it because we, we can get ahead of the data now. Thank you both. I'm super appreciative. I know our families are gonna be appreciative. I don't think many families understand that um, how much can be collected from a uh, spit sample so it's great that this can continue during covid so you know we always encourage our families to work with their team and their professionals um taking care of them and hopefully they can move this path forward if um, they are looking for a diagnosis well we'll conclude today's interview thank you both again um we have additional um, COVID-19 resource, um, um, resources on our website, www.childneurologyfoundation.org slash COVID-19. And together we will get through this. Together we are all child neurology.